Hello and welcome to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Anala and I make videos on classic literature and writing. In today's video, we will be discussing none other than the beloved children's classic The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett, published in 1911. Hmm, hot. But before we get into the plot of this wonderful piece of fiction, let's talk a little bit about Frances, as she was such an impressive woman of her time. Should you wish to skip this background story or any other part of the video, then these are the timestamps and I will put these in the description as well. So why don't you make yourself comfortable with a nice cup of tea like I have here or any other beverage of your choice and let's get started. Frances Hodgson Burnett was born in 1849 in Manchester, England. She was part of a middle-class family as her father had his own business, but he died in 1852, which left the family with a significantly lower income, so they had to move out of their house in the city centre. As the family income kept on declining, they eventually had to take up the offer from Francis' uncle to come and live with him in Knoxville, Tennessee, meaning that the whole family emigrated in 1865 to the United States. Unfortunately, the family finances kept on declining and by the time Frances had, re had reached her late teens, she would sell her writings to magazines to help their income. She worked constantly with the aim of helping her family and by 1869 she had actually made enough money for them to move to a better home in Knoxville. Her mother died soon after that and within a couple of years three of her siblings had gotten married. In 1873 it was time for Frances to get married as well to a man she had befriended during their time in Knoxville called Swan Burnett and within a year she had given birth to their first son. Frances was actually the provider of the family and she made enough money for them to move to Paris where her husband could take up medical training. However, when, when it was time for them to return to the US, this time to live in Washington, they were actually in debt, so Frances had to work very hard to keep the family afloat. But, as she was a woman, it was also her responsibility to care for the household as well as the children on top of her normal writing schedule. And because of this, she actually worked herself into exhaustion and depression. During that time in Washington, Frances managed to make a name for herself in political and literary circles. Her husband's medical practice also grew quite successful, but she continued to write as she was still making more money than him. Her success continued with the book Little Lord Fauntleroy, which was also adapted into a stage play both in London and Broadway. It's around this time, in the late 1880s, that she went back to live in England for a while. Tragedy struck the family in 1890 when their eldest son died from consumption, also called tuberculosis. This, of course, had a tremendous effect on Frances and she sank into a deep depression. She spent a couple of years recovering, uh, while also devoting her time to spiritualism and charity. In 1892, she returned to Washington and took up writing again. Some years later, in 1898, Frances filed for divorce from her husband. This wasn't very common at the time, and the press was anything but kind about it. The Washington Post wrote about their divorce as being the result of Frances' advanced ideas regarding the duties of a wife and the rights of women. Moving back to England, Frances settled down for about a decade at the country house of Great Maitham Hall where she would eventually have the inspiration for the secret garden. She lived a social, country house style of life. And this is when she had the actor Stephen Townsend move in with her, causing a bit of a scandal. They did, however, eventually get married, but the marriage was an unhappy one. 
She was in her 50s and Townsend was 10 years younger than her. She even referred to him as her secretary. So this was hardly a relationship between equals. The marriage ended after only two years, upon which Frances returned to the United States for a while. But after a brief time in the US, she returned to England again and was once again back at work to finance her luxurious lifestyle. Frances finally settled down in 1908 in a house she had commissioned herself on Long Island. Ah, oh, the garbage truck. The garbage truck. Every single time. This is where she lived when The Secret Garden was published in 1911 and it was also where she lived for the remainder of her life until her death in 1924 when she was 74 years old. Frances Hodgson Burnett was undoubtedly a very progressive and modern woman for her time. Being well-traveled, twice divorced and financially independent from the men of her life, she must have been a thorn in the side of her more conservative peers. But this is exactly why she stands out to us today and in my opinion in the most positive way. I'm fascinated and inspired by her life story and this is why I wanted to share it in this video. But let's now move on to the story of the secret garden. The story starts in India around the turn of the 20th century, where nine-year-old Mary Lennox lives with her parents. She is a spoiled, unloved and neglected child. Her parents don't really bother with her and she is left with her Indian servants who are ordered to obey her every whim. One night, as Mary was sleeping, tragedy strikes the household. There is a cholera breakout during a dinner party, which kills both of her parents as well as her maid. And the other servants flee the house to escape possible infection. Since no one liked Mary, no one really bothered to wake her up and bring her with them to safety. So, some hours later, Mary wakes up in a quiet house. She gets furious that her maid isn't there to wait on her, but eventually she goes downstairs and finds the dining room, with all the chairs pulled out and with food still on the table, as if everyone had left in a hurry. She eats some of these leftovers and drinks some wine, which then made her very sleepy, so she went back to bed. The next time she wakes up, she is discovered by two policemen who lets her in on the situation. Oddly enough, Mary isn't really that sad about her parents being dead, because she really didn't have a relationship with them. She was also far too self-centered to care about anyone other than herself. Moving forward, Mary is sent to Yorkshire, England to live with her uncle Mr. Craven at his great estate Misselthwaite Manor. Upon arrival, she's met up by the housekeeper, Mrs. Medlock, who lets her know that Mr. Craven is uh, a sad and sickly old widower and under no circumstances is she allowed to disturb him. He's not even there to greet her when she arrives. So Mary is now settled in her own rooms in this large house out on the moor. She's completely baffled by this environment as it's so different from what she was used to back in India. She is even more baffled by her new maid, Martha, a local girl who doesn't really have any formal training in being a proper maid. She is very talkative and she won't help Mary get dressed as she believes everyone, regardless of their status, should be able to put their own socks on. Unsurprisingly, Mary is not impressed and she was quite vocal about it too. Since there wasn't much for Mary to do indoors, she spends most of her days outside. This was late winter, early spring, um, but despite it being cold and rugged, there was something about it that gave her energy. She would walk around the many gardens, uh, finding a new fascination for things that grow. She gets acquainted with one of the gardeners, Ben Weatherstaff, 
which is the most wonderful name in the world, by the way. Weatherstaff. Weatherstaff. He explains a thing or two about gardening and introduces her to a local bird, uh, a robin redbreast to be exact. And Mary finds herself delighted for what is most likely the first time in her entire life. Mary quickly realizes that there's something not quite right in the gardens. The more she walks around, the more she realizes that there's an area she can't access. There are walls around it, but no door. This is when Martha tells her the story about the closed up garden that no one has entered for 10 years. And that it belonged to Mrs. Craven, but that Mr. Craven had buried the key after her passing. Of course, this is irresistible for a little girl like Mary, who's just discovered what curiosity feels like. So she manages to find the door behind all this overgrown ivy, and pretty soon she finds the key as well. So she sneaks inside the garden and finds it overgrown and neglected. There were some buds that were sticking up from the ground and she cleared some of the weeds around them and this is when she decided that she's going to revive this garden, make it nice and pretty again. The mission has officially started. She ends up getting the help of Dickon, the 12 year old brother of Martha, her maid. Dickon has lived his whole life out on the moor and he spends his days with his animal companions and he knows a lot about plants and nature in general. So he has quite a lot to teach Mary. Mary, who is now 10, is quickly smitten by him. She's impressed at his way of communicating with animals and all of his knowledge of nature. So they develop a strong friendship fairly quickly. This is when we get to meet Mr. Craven for the first time. He sends for Mary to come to his library and he tells her that he will be traveling and will therefore be away for quite a few months. He asks her if she needs anything like books and such and she asks him very carefully if she can have a bit of earth so that she could plant things in the garden. She doesn't tell him that she has in fact found the secret garden um, but he finds this request endearing and agrees to it without asking any further questions. One night, Mary wakes up from the bad weather making a lot of noise. And as she tries to fall back asleep, she hears the unmistakable sound of crying. So she gets a candle and walks down the deserted corridors in search of the sound. And this is not actually the first time she's heard it, but none of the servants would ever tell her what it was. Mysterious. So she finally finds the room with the crying and opens the door, only to find a lavishly decorated room with a boy lying in his bed. This turned out to be Colin Craven. I almost said Colin Creevy there. <laughs> He's Mr. Craven's 10 year old son. Neither of them knew that the other person even existed. Colin always kept his room because he was a sickly child and an invalid. Or at least he would be one day when he grows an inevitable hunchback just like his father. The two children have a very strange conversation. We find out that Colin is dying because that's what everyone says. His, his own father can't even bear to look at him so he never sees him and he doesn't really know him. He also says that his own doctor wishes him to die as the doctor is actually a relative of theirs and would therefore be the sole heir to Misselthwaite Manor if he dies. That's a heavy conversation for a pair of 10 year olds. We also find out that Colin is a bit hysterical, but I suppose anyone would be if you spent your entire life just waiting for a lump to grow on your back. As a result, he's terribly anxious and he tends to frighten the servants with his tantrums. And when he's not hysterical, he's just a bitter old man in a 10 year old's body. But for some reason, he immediately likes Mary and she tells him stories about Dickon and his animals. And she even tells him about the secret garden. Colin is mesmerized by the idea of this secret garden and he even considers going outside in his wheelchair so that he can visit it something which he hasn't done for many, many years as he's terrified of the outdoors. 
One day, Mary gets a bit preoccupied as she and Dickon is working in the garden, and she makes the decision that she won't go and see Colin that day. It didn't really occur to her that this would make him sad or upset because she wasn't really used to thinking of other people. So Colin throws a huge tantrum that night, waking up the entire house, including Mary. So the nurse comes to fetch her, hoping that she might be able to calm him down. But instead of being nice, Mary proceeds to give him the scolding of his life, which actually had a surprising effect on him. We find out that he has worked himself into a panic attack because he claims to have felt a lump on his back, which of course triggers his fear of an early death. Thankfully, the nurse and Mary could have a proper look and find that there was no lump, it was just his spine because he's so skinny. After this, Mary takes on a more gentle approach and starts singing him some lullabies from India to make him fall back asleep. This really shows a change in her character, that she took pity on another person and wants to make them feel better. The next day, Dickon comes over to visit them in Colin's room with, and bringing all of his animals, meaning a lamb, a crow, two squirrels and a fox. So that definitely gave the servants something to gossip about. As Colin starts to spend more and more time with Dickon and Mary, his outlook on life begins to change. He starts to want things. He wants to go outside. He wants to feel fresh air. He wants to see the world for himself rather than just hearing about it. Eventually, they make up a plan for him to be carried down on the stairs and taken out into the garden in his wheelchair. The children are very secretive um, to get them all into the secret garden without being seen. Already from this first visit, Colin feels invigorated by the garden and the fresh air. He feels like he's going to live forever and, more importantly, he wants to. He feels so much stronger and livelier. He even manages to stand up on his own legs, showing that he actually has a straight back and working legs, albeit weak ones from having lied down his entire life. The three children continue to visit the garden in secret, working on it throughout the entire spring. And Colin practices every day by doing a bit of standing and walking with the help of Dickon. Dickon also teaches him some exercises so that he can strengthen his muscles. And he does get stronger for every day that passes. This is when the main mission takes on a shift. At first, it was all about fixing up the garden, but now it's about fixing Colin, both inside and out. Apart from his weakened body, he was awfully entitled and spoiled in his behavior. Mary makes a point of this, and she's not really the one to sugarcoat things. She tells him that he's rude to his doctor, and if the doctor had been his father, he would have slapped him for his rudeness. Colin, of course, had no idea this was how other people perceived him, and he made a significant change to his attitude after this. One character that we've heard quite a lot about, but not yet met, is that of Dickon's mother, Mrs. Sowerby. I think it's pronounced that way. Sowerby? Sowerby? She's mentioned many times either by Martha, um, who's Mary's maid, or by Dickon, or even by the housekeeper, Mrs. Medlock, as she would used to go to school with her. She is described as the most wonderful mother in the world, who always knows how to treat children and what's best for them, essentially. Having no mothers of their own, Mary and Colin are quite intrigued by her. So the children, <clears throat> so the children decide to let her in on the secret and she is invited to visit them at the garden. Mrs. Sowerby had never actually met Colin, but she had heard the awful stories about him being a hysterical cripple who would frighten his servants with his tantrums. So when she actually did see him, she was surprised to find him walking like a normal healthy boy and, and being friendly and sweet. This made her write a letter to Mr. Craven, where he was staying in Italy at the time, urging him to come home, um, but not telling him exactly why. So Mr. Craven receives this letter and 
gets curious as well as a bit anxious. He fears that his son is perhaps getting worse, maybe even dying. So he travels back to England immediately, thinking about what a bad father he has been uh, throughout these years, but he simply had not been able to get over the sadness and grief of his wife dying. And then to see his crippled son, who looked so much like her, was too much for him to bear. So he simply ran away from it as often as he could. Which is very sad. Once he's back at Mistlethwaite Manor, he's met by his housekeeper, Mrs. Matlock, who confirms that Colin is indeed displaying a change in behaviour. He's even outside, in the garden, every day. So Mr. Craven goes to the garden and by instinct he knows where to go. He just has this feeling, you know. And of course he meets the children there and is incredibly shocked by the sight of his son, who was actually running at this point. So father and son have a sweet little reunion, or, you know, union, I suppose, and they all walk back to the house together. The end. There are undoubtedly a lot of adult themes in classic children's book, many of which are very dark and heavy subjects. The situation that Mary finds herself in at the start of the story, being abandoned at her own house after a cholera outbreak, is just insane to me. This is really downplayed in the story too, as if it could happen to anyone and isn't really a big deal. I just feel like any child would have been severely traumatized after an event like that. But I suppose these things are usually quite manageable in fiction. I suppose it wouldn't have been a very fun read if little Mary never actually discovered the secret garden because she was busy getting treated for PTSD. And then we have Colin. <laughs> like I said, a bitter old man in a 10 year old's body. He's an invalid, spending his days in his bed, thinking that he's going to die. And during the night, he's so fearful about this that he cries about it loudly, thus waking Mary up a few corridors down. Mary's role in his life becomes that of encouragement and hope. She gives him the will to live and she knows it. It's an incredibly heavy burden, but this is also played down thanks to the simple minds of children. She sees a problem, she fixes it. It's as easy as that and she doesn't really dwell on it any further. This book really has some wonderful examples of the inner workings of children's minds. I think we can all remember a time from our childhoods when we had a secret of sorts either for ourselves or with friends, and how that secret was just the most important thing in the entire world. How excited we would get, and we would giggle and whisper about it. This is portrayed in such a heartwarming way. First when Mary finds out about the garden herself, and then when she, Dickon and Colin start going there together in secret. As a reader, you feel like you are in on the secret as well, and that's really nice, I must say. Another strange detail that I really liked uh, was the fact that Mary always thought of Colin as a Raja. Whenever he spoke with his servants, Whenever he gave them orders and such, he had a proud, princely look about him that made her think of this Raja she had met at some point, with all his jewels and pearls and grandeur. And from that moment on in the book, whenever Colin speaks to a servant, it's described as if it was the Raja saying it, not Colin. And that's such a sweet way to let the reader in on Mary's imagination. Aside from being a heartwarming and beautiful story, The Secret Garden has a very sad premise. On two opposite sides of the world, we have two children, Mary in India and Colin in Britain, who both suffered from parental neglect. 
They didn't know this themselves, of course, but the lack of proper guidance from the adults in their lives had a damaging effect on their personalities. They were both surrounded by servants who were ordered to obey their every word, which is simply not a good situation for a child. Having boundaries is not just about learning right from wrong and to think about other people. It shows the child that they are loved and cared for and that they can feel safe and that adults have things under control. As we can clearly see in the story, a child with too much power will act irrationally because they are not emotionally mature enough to handle that kind of responsibility. In a way, there's a nice bit of symbolism in how Mary and Colin are both very damaged individuals at the start of their respective arcs, but with time and care they begin to thrive, just like the garden did. The children took care of the garden, and the garden took care of them in return. But, I have to say, I'm slightly disappointed at the lack of resolution in the story for Mary. Somewhere around the midpoint, focus tends to shift to Colin instead of her, which is fine. But that continues all the way to the end and Colin is giving an excellent resolution for his arc, while she has been demoted to a side character. I mean, look, I have questions. Did Mary develop a good relationship with Mr. Craven as well? Did he perhaps adopt her and give her the fatherly affections she'd never had before? Or maybe Mary started spending more and more time over at Dickon's house with Mrs. Sowerby, thereby getting parental guidance that way. Mary seemed to have developed a crush on Dickon pretty early on, so did they perhaps get married as adults? I'm just that kind of reader who likes to know these things, or maybe not exactly no, I mean I, I can be satisfied with a hint or two, but I do prefer to know. <laughs> There's just something very satisfying about knowing where the characters end up and such. It's a very small negative because overall I thought this was a wonderful read and I would recommend it. So those were my thoughts on The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. Now, I'm very curious whether you've read the book and what your thoughts are. I love discussing books and everything around them, so even if you haven't read it, if you have any thoughts on what I've been talking about in this video, feel free to drop me a comment. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Thank you so much for watching today and I hope to see you back next time.